Coming up on Avant Technology Insights with Ken Presti. Sassy is not a product. You're, you're not going to go and, and buy a Sassy box. It is a framework and it is a strategy. We're talking about Secure Access Service Edge, better known as Sassy. We're seeing security converging with WAN automation, intelligence, management, and related capabilities into a single cloud native platform. This as opposed to managing as many as 40 or 50 different products. So, how does all this impact the enterprise decision maker? Funny you should ask. We'll cover that in just a moment. Welcome to Avant Technology Insights. I'm your host, Ken Presti, Vice President of Avant Research and Analytics. The link between solving business challenges and cutting-edge technologies has become tighter and more complex than ever before. In this podcast series from Avant Research and Analytics, we help enterprise decision makers sort through the business case, the value, the challenges, and ultimately the bottom line of technology adoption. So listen to us at your desktop, take us in the car, tune in from the commuter train, or download us at the gate. You'll find us on Apple, Spotify, and Google, as well as at www.goavant.net slash podcast. My guest today has 20 years of experience driving market adoption of of best-of-breed and disruptive software and technology solutions, including SD-WAN, Cloud and Software as a Service, Managed Security, Business Intelligence, and Analytics. He's well entrenched in the security, network intelligence, and routing necessary to breathe life into the Secure Access Service Edge, or SASE. He's the head of channels and alliances at Open Systems, a 30-year-old cybersecurity company. I want to welcome Dave Nudie. Dave Nudie, thanks for joining us today. Our topic is Secure Access Service Edge. Quite a mouthful, but we now call it SASE. Uh, this has been something that's been kind of evolving over the course of the past year. Uh, it's an interesting approach to security. I'm going to ask you to tee us up if you don't mind. Uh, what is SASE and what does it do? Well, SASE is a business framework that was, you know, created by Gartner. And I always like to remind people that Gartner creates these categories in reaction to what's already happening in the market to put an agreed upon framework and strategy around it. Uh, they're not predicting the future and what it is dealing with and recognizing is the convergence of security layer responsibilities in the network layer now converging with WAN automation intelligence uh, and ongoing management into single unified cloud native platforms. It just basically means that we're taking what traditionally has been siloed approaches to security and WAN visibility and performance and merging that into single platforms uh, that have some tremendous tactical advantages that are attached to it. Distill that down, if you would, to what that would mean to an enterprise decision maker who has to deal with both networking and security. Well, on one hand, you could look at it at a very simplistic level and say, I just need fewer boxes. And there's a certain value point that comes from that. But the, the real message of the day here is around convergence and unification on what has become an extremely challenging task of trying to service chain and unify as many as 40 to 50 suppliers within an enterprise environment that has traditionally been the responsibility of the IT team to unify, bring, bring visibility tools together, make sure you know patches don't break patches, policy doesn't conflict with policy. And that continues to become more and more difficult in a market where it's it's extremely difficult to hire the talent on to be able to do that as it is, um, let alone be able to maintain it going forward. Uh, it, it just is becoming a, a, an impossible task outside of the fortune few to be able to do that on their own. Okay, so yeah, this is something that we hear about quite a bit in terms of security and networking being a, a difficult task. What are you seeing? You know, you mentioned like forty or fifty different things um, that are involved in this. What are you seeing as the uh, the basic components of SASE? Well, I mean, the the key element is when you look at security and routing. The reason that this thing came together uh, is that 
the distribution of application destinations and users is that this is no longer the days of the you know the nice constrained physical footprint of connectivity and applications in the data center driven by the variety of where your application endpoints can be and where your users can be and accessing them both internal and external users in the form of partners and alliances um, it now requires a very broad set uh, you know, not only of, of raw technology components to be able to accommodate all of that, but an incredible amount of automation to make that useful. And so you know, where SASE comes into play um, is not just about, hey, I have one throat to choke instead of 50. Um, it has much more to do with you know, innovation and, and unification of what, is, what has been an, an acronym soup of requirement that uh, CIOs and CISOs have had to track down over the years. Speaking of acronym soup, um, network functions virtualization was something that was a definite buzzword in the industry going back a couple of years ago. I think it's still bumping around these days as well. How is SASE different from that in, in the sense that you've got you know security being deployed in the way that it is um, as opposed to having a lot of discrete boxes? Yeah, well, the name of the game is less about the physical infrastructure and the stack of technology and more around having a unified set of policy and rules and visibility and performance enhancement and having the ability to place that wherever it needs to be to accommodate the diversity of application endpoints and users that are accessing it. So being able to virtualize this capability and be able to put it in the cloud to be able to put it in full high you know redundancy deployments in aws or azure or google cloud or or choose your your provider it is absolutely critical and we ran into a scenario not long ago where companies had been following the rules they had been given for the last 20 years, which is a very technology-based approach. You have to buy the tech and you do. The technology remains very, very important, but they ran into challenges and in how they were able to replicate that technology footprint into virtual environments. And that has been answered through innovators like Open Systems as an example, where you're now agnostic to uh, the endpoints of this this technology and this rule set that you truly can place it wherever it needs to be to accommodate all of the diversity of the WAN edge. So it, so in essence, we're talking about a, it's not a, just a technology, but also more of a strategy, which kind of moves the cheese a little bit, because on the one hand, we're used to looking at technologies, but, and, and also at strategies, that's certainly true. But we're all we're generally used to looking at security as something that is solved by technologies. Um, build me in if a little bit more on what it takes for an enterprise decision maker to put that strategy together that gets things to the next level. That's such an important point, Ken. Is that SASE is not a product. You're you're not going to go and and buy a SASE box. It is a framework, and it is a strategy um, that gives you, you know really infinite agility in being able to respond to changes within the environment. It allows the IT department to operate at the speed of the business, in many cases, faster than the business. I've had customers on our end that absolutely love flipping the script on their their business overlords and asking the business what's taking them so long, IT is ready to go. Mm. Um, these are uh, real key elements in, in just, we've had, five years worth of transition and automation crammed inside of five months during the year of 2020. And, you know, platforms that operate under this strategy of already being unified and being flexible without compromise, uh, were able to dynamically respond to that. If you were anchored by, um, you know, where you could physically deploy employment or, or, or you were held back by the diversity of skill set that you have on your technical IT team, um, that was a real, not only challenge over the course of the year, but a tremendous threat to the business as well. Um, because when when scenarios like like the, you know, the, the pandemic uh, take place, uh, the bad actors in the world don't don't look at that as a reason to cut you some slack. Rather, they smell blood in the water and they know that you're vulnerable if you're not able to respond to something like this. And there were a large number of companies that experienced that over the last year. 
So in looking at your PowerPoint slides of a couple of weeks ago, I saw three basic mantras. Technology is difficult, technology is not enough, and automation is not optional. So we've covered, or at least set the stage at least, for the technology being difficult part and also the technology not being enough. Take me down the path of automation and where all that fits into this. Yeah, I think the real key here is that even if you can do the technology very well, which puts you in a very small group these days uh, because of the diversity that's involved, is that what you come to find out is that 90% of companies that experience a breach have up-to-date technology. They say they've been doing what they've been told on cybersecurity policy and technologies. The investments have been made, um, yet yet 90% of companies that say they do that extremely well um, that experience of breach rather say they were doing that extremely well so so you've got to pair that with with monitoring and detection and that's that's the middle element of technology you know not being enough on its own you've got to have a feedback loop um, in detection and response to see what's happening to operate under a state of breach uh, as if you're under a constant state of breach rather than trying to posture yourself with technology to be able to respond after something bad has already happened it's there's a very you know key difference there and where the automation piece comes into play is that once you've positioned your technology to ingest visibility and logs and telemetry uh, and information that needs to be monitored and sorted through to understand where the team needs to engage to identify true positives from false positives at the security layer, that cannot be done manually. You, you, you simply cannot stare, stare at a pane of glass and look through a volume of activity uh, that comes across a security monitoring platform and be able to manually identify what are the true positives, what are the false positives. You know, the security analysts is so expensive as it is, the last thing you want them doing is spinning their wheels uh, and being distracted with normal traffic activity um, it, while something has already come in behind them and is now dwelling within your environment. So those automation engines really are not optional. Uh, to being able to execute very well. And that's where these platforms, Gartner says 50% of enterprises by 2025 will be using an MDR service, a, a layering on on top of their technology layer. And they're going to leverage platforms that already have that automation in spades, um, not trying to, to architect and build these environments on their own. Um, it just you know, economically and, and safety wise, just doesn't make sense to do so. You'd rather use a force multiplier to get those things done. How far along has automation come in this particular context? Can you get automation to also handle the rem remediation aspect of all this? We hear about artificial intelligence all the time. And depending on who you talk to, you either see an eye roll or you see someone lean into the, to the conversation. And it, to be honest with you, it's a combination. You know, there's still human learning is critical to go into this because at, at the end of the day, automation is looking for something it hasn't seen before to escalate to the human element to determine uh, what type of response and what type of course of action they need to take. And then, you know, the, the human being involved is critical in enriching uh, the detection and the automation piece with what they've learned on a real-time basis. So um, th th that's, that, that feedback loop is, is critical. And it's true of any ecosystem. You simply have to have that feedback loop and it feeds into the automation. And, and what happens with that now means that um, I always I like the analogy of uh, tire pressure sensors on our cars. We have you know, one on each wheel, it fires off every few seconds. Imagine if every single one of those readings came across the dashboard of your car. Uh, and then somewhere mixed within them was one that actually told you um, that you needed to put 10 more pounds of pressure into the front right tire. Um, and the fatigue that would come from that overwhelming amount of volume, you know, automation in place prevents you from having to see the normal readings and only escalates and highlights the ones that you need to truly take action on. And that's why it's so important. Okay. It's interesting how this industry works because something new and cool will arrive on the scene and suddenly everybody's got it in one form or another. I mean, they may not have it at a useful level, but they'll find some way of tying back into it to suggest that they've got a presence there in one form or another. You know, we've seen that happen time and time again in, in, in this, in this industry. It's, it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, looking at this, from the the enterprise perspective it all sounds very good uh but it's not it's it's not a box it's not a single service it's kind of an approach to things how do i 
as a customer, try to look at this as a way of, you know, of, of enabling it and taking those next steps. So if I'm, if I'm a buyer and I look at this and I say, yeah, that sounds like some pretty cool stuff. And I think it would be pretty effective in my, uh, in my organization, at least in principle, what are those next steps that I need to take to get to, to make it tangible? Well, I think the, the key thing that we're finding with our customers is that IT leadership is much less about technology management today as it is with partner management. Working with force multipliers that can enhance their team, uh, fill in the gaps in tech areas of technical expertise that they don't necessarily have, do not want to, or are un unable to hire for. Um, and and as our senior product uh, manager on, on MDR puts it, is that the bad guys collaborate like crazy out there in the field. They have online water coolers or trading tools. They are trying to launch that next zero day threat that no one's ever seen before. Um, you know, that's what they do. And, and they work in unbelievable aggregate levels of intelligence. And why would a single company think that they can stand up to that on their own? Why would you not team up with the good guys to be able to deal with that? Um, and that's what we become for for our customers within the conversation. That's part of the strategy that they look at is how do I become bigger than I am by leveraging, uh, you know, planes of intelligence and experience that I simply do not have, cannot build, and really don't even have the desire to have to go and try and build on my own when I can instead, um, you have these services that I can leverage immediately out of the gate and give me that leg up on the, on the threats that exist within the security layer. So who needs to be involved in this discussion? I mean, I'm thinking that the security people need to be there, and I'm guessing the network people need to be there too. And then you end up in a situation of uh, who owns it, who's responsible, who has ultimate authority. How are you seeing all that break down? Not break down, but how, do you, how are you seeing it all, all that coalesce at the customer level? Yeah, uh, the message of the day is as quickly as those two separate areas that have been separate historically can remove the separation and and unify their conversation that's where the big win is for the enterprise you know th there should not be and, and there generally aren't network layer decisions that are being made without consideration from the security layer and quite frankly security layer policy can impact network layer policy where now we're implementing automation where the network is dynamically making decisions to fall over from one path to another to load balance to, to aggregate to prioritize traffic and as quickly as possible as you can have the security layer able to see and dynamically respond to that in kind that is you know networking and security valhalla is when you have policy that sees policy rule set that sees rule set, rule set across areas of the IT environment that in the past have been siloed because they were allowed to be, but now uh, due to diversity at the edge, have to be in sync with one another. That is you know, the magic to the game. We have you know, customers, for example, the, you know, that are doing emergency response in some of the worst geographies on the planet, and they get a satellite internet link wherever they can, and, they, and they're able to send out one technology payload that covers the network, the security, the monitoring, detection, and management in a, in a single deployment. Um, and that's just as relevant for them as it would be for the whitest of white collar, you know, deployments into a new high rise building in downtown New York City. It, that type of agility is, is universal. Um, those are equal opportunity problems, regardless of the vertical industry um, that IT leaders should be looking at today. In what types of network environments does this work the best? And then a follow-up question, obviously, coming is in what type of network environment does this work the least? Uh, is this a, I don't want to call it one size fits all because it's so variable and it's so customized, but is it a situation where regardless of what I'm running on my network and regardless of what I'm doing, this is a viable option? Exactly. It it's it should be connectivity agnostic it, it should allow you because you you have different availability of, of different resources depending upon the the geography um, and the business case and so the tech it's a technology layer that essentially becomes agnostic to the physical underlay layer but it's able to get you the most that you can performance wise and able to lock down the security 
uh, from end to end uh, across that connectivity layer. Now, an important element of SASE as well is that it's cloud native. You know, that means that that this pla these platforms exist in the cloud and allow you to deploy it over any underlay that you have, but as well as being able to put the same set of policies, you know, at the doorstep of cloud and SaaS applications as well. Um, so it, it, it sh this should be very freeing, where in the past, you know, there were technologies we'd invest in and, and they would almost requ highly recommend, if not require, a private link or certain brand of, of underlay to utilize with it. Um, and today, you know, with the, the diversity, the, the rise of the public WAN, the, the requirement for more internet, less private networking, depending upon the use case, it's just a much more comfortable place to be to, to realize that I'm simply not held hostage to the underlay any longer. I actually have infinite flexibility there. Hmm. That's that's uh, an off, an awesome uh, value proposition right there. So from the standpoint of the customer, yet again, um, I'm going to talk to my trusted advisor about this, obviously, before I make a move, because this is a highly customized and a highly complex kind of thing to move to. What are the sorts of things that I need to be able to provide to that trusted advisor so that those trusted advisors can make the right decision on my behalf? What do I need to pull together just for the table stakes of having the right conversation? For the trusted advisor, I think there's a bit of challenger sale in this that's backed up by the market today. And I love pointing out that things I'm talking about today aren't my personal opinions. It's you know, When Gartner creates these categories, it's reactive. When you look at the convergence that large technology players are doing, or now they are now investing and in gobbling up all the SD-WAN players, for example, into larger platforms, all of this is happening for a reason. It's because of market demand. And I, when I, one thing that I enjoyed talking about with your team uh, last week, uh, and, and you, you guys rightfully stopped me in my tracks to explain this, is just saying that the model of best of breed is dead. You can't do it any longer. And trusted advisors for years have, have perhaps approached their customers and said, you know, let's do best of breed on an individual technology component level across the board and ignoring the back end reciprocal impact of the of the expertise you have to have on staff, the ability to unify that, you know, you know, policy framework, the you know, the the Frankensteining of duct taping that together, um, you know, that is just an, an a near impossible task today. You know, and best of breed is subjective. Who, who one person's best of breed is totally different from somebody else's best of breed. It's it's you know infiltrated by bias and what they know and the expertise that they have or do not have on staff. There's always you know, compromise within that. And, you know, given the sheer volume of options that are available today, that's where this conversation comes into play, that is looking at platforms that without compromise, mitigate the challenges of trying to piece, it, piece this together uh, on a component by component basis, and instead going to a company that is already not just and that has already integrated that entire environment and can customize it and configure it exactly to the requirement of exactly what they need at exactly the level that they need it. No one's spending money on anything they don't require that doesn't fit their use case. You know, that's that work has been done for them. We have a customer CISO that we work with has 35,000 end users and initially launched a best of breed approach to it and met open systems and looked at, at what we were doing and said, why on earth? Would I try and go and build this up by myself when I know a year from now it's going to change? And and I look at what you've done here and you've paired it with detection, you've paired it with all the automation that I need. What You are my desired outcome. It's, this is an outcome-based sale. Stay away from the technology component. Ask your end customer about what the outcomes are they're truly trying to achieve. Ask why, um, uh, you know, two, three times to get to that that true reason. And I think uh, I think once you start talking at an outcome level, you get away from the the technology rat hole that usually tends to follow. So you realize that you just went after one of the crown jewels of the trusted advisor community because it's that best of breed thing that that really helps them to raise their value. I'm not sure that I'm clear on why best of breed would be would be dead at this point because um, you know there's going to be a lot of different offerings, a lot of different flavors. Uh, best of breed would be widely open to interpretation. You know, I mean, it may not even be objective; it could be very subjective. Uh, 
Um, but you've got a lot of different companies out there with a lot of different relationships and a lot of different biases with a lot of different values. They may like certain features better than others. Um, they may like the stability of one company over another. It could be anything, some of which is real and some of which, frankly, might even be imagined. Um, if I'm a trusted advisor, why would I go in one direction as opposed to being able to spread it out and build what I feel as a trusted advisor is the the right combination for my particular customer? Yeah. So from our viewpoint and you know, looking at the market, what's taking place is is best of breed is replaced with best of platform. And, and that's where the conversation is, is convergence and as a service is inevitable. How many areas within our lives do we need to see this um, before we, we understand that it's now coming to the security layer? And those that have lived on, you know, selling point solutions with management agreements and, and you know, warranties and, um, you know, service providers, like, those things are under assault by platforms that just do it more intelligently uh, and without compromise you know the analogy that i used in the call last week is you asked 10 people who enjoy the game of football to put their pro bowl team defense on the field yeah it, it is subjective yeah it right is. Yeah. and and you when you ask those 10 people to do that all 10 people will put a different team on the field because they they're it's subjective on on who they think is the best and, and yeah i actually i promise you two things on the back end of that all 10 teams will be different because of that reason and I will beat you 10 times out of 10 with yeah, the Kansas I know. City Kansas Chiefs. City Chiefs. I know. We, we, we... <laughs> right. Because they're already in the same playbook. They already know where they're going to be. That unification is already done. They've worked. They've drilled. They've they've covered each other's zones. They, you know, you know where, where instead you have a bunch of individuals um, within the technology layer that you are now responsible for unifying that. Pat Gelsinger is the CEO of VMware. He was at RSA earlier this year. He said, look, it's not that customers don't have tools. They have tons of tools. They just don't know how to unify them. And they're demanding simplification of this. And if you are not a platform and you don't have security and management at the forefront of that, you are a part of the problem. You are not a part of the solution. Mm. Um, and, and when you look at the investments of Cisco, VMware, HP, um, you know, Juniper, Oracle, across the board, um, you're seeing these platforms being formed. Follow the billions of dollars and what's being spent. Um, you know, on, and all of a sudden, this concept of best of breed going to best of platform all of a sudden doesn't sound too controversial. And those are things that you can put in front of your end client and 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 challenge them and ask them: Are they paying attention? Are are they seeing what is happening right before their very eyes? It's not a a closed off radical thought. There are billions of dollars changing hands in the formation of this model. Okay, so aside from um, you know best of breed versus best of platform, looking at SASE as a whole, what does it mean to the spreadsheet? I mean, obviously, we need to have very good uh, good security, you know, in any company. What? How does it look for, in terms of uh, the cost analysis? I mean, the return on investment is tremendous because you're you're able to execute within categories at economies of scale within unified platforms like this that you just can't accomplish by yourself as an individual company. And the more that you leverage these platforms, the faster that return comes back. And in addition to the return on investment that comes from them is better security, better visibility, better actionable insights for your team to be able to take, better agility uh, in dealing with change. You know, that's the name of the game. Yes, you're going to save a, a lot of money um, in these platforms. I'm confident in saying that our customers have all seen it. Um, but, you know, that actually is lower on the value proposition conversation than simply the agility and having the technology and the ability to protect intellectual property and protect users and make sure performance works well, that the business, um, you know, level challenges are, are equally met and exceeded at the IT and technology layer um, as much as it is uh, a return on investment in leveraging the platform. 
All right. Dave Nudy, head of channels at Open Systems. Thank you very much for joining us today. Really interesting take on SASE and how it uh, how it's evolving and becoming part of the common uh, security and networking vernacular of the industry. I think we're going to be hearing a lot more about this as time goes on. And I want to thank you for your perspectives. Uh, very much appreciate your being on the show today, sir. I really enjoyed the opportunity, Ken. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to Avant Technology Insights with Ken Presti, featuring information and opinions on how key technologies can be leveraged to solve business problems. Avant Technology Insights is a service of Avant Communications, a platform for IT decision making. All opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the guest and the host. For more information, please feel free to download our research reports and other resources at www.goavant.com. Net. That's www.goav as in victory, ant.net. For Avant Research and Analytics, I'm Ken Presti.